Hello, and again, I want to welcome everyone to the event at the Yale Information Society Project, um, a project founded by Professor Jeff Vulcan, um, who's going to be in tonight's second panel. Um, and uh, we're here today to discuss the Facebook files, uh, the documents gathered by and testified to by Francis Haugen and reported on by the Wall Street Journal. And we're asking the question, what's next? And we're asking in two pretty amazing lineups of panels. One that is based uh, with those who have been active in the tech and law fields for quite a while, and one who have been active in the tech and law fields as academics for quite a while. And both should have a lot to say about where this is headed and what's going to come out of this discussion. Um, and these this new trove of information that Francis has provided. Um, so just to give you a very brief overlay of what uh, today's uh, event is going to entail and some of the nature of the event that it's going to have to happen simply because of the incredible response, which has been wonderful, but it has been much more than we anticipated. Um, there are about 2,500 people registered for this event who are going to be coming in and out of the webinar. It is also being recorded and live streamed uh, onto YouTube right now. So if you are going to ask a question, the only kinds of questions we're going to acknowledge are in the Q&A uh, section of Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen. We, are, we will not be responding to raised hands or anything placed in the chat. Uh, please state your question as briefly as possible and your name and affiliation. And we are going to be going through and selecting questions to be asked in the last 20 minutes of each panel to the panelists. And you can include which panelist you would prefer um, to have asked the question. Um, so each panel is going to be about 90 minutes long with uh, about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. And uh, we will hopefully wrap this panel. We're gonna start a little, we're gonna run a little bit over, probably around 7.40. And then we'll have a five minute break until 7.45 where we'll start the second panel um, of the evening. And so I'm not, I'm going to forego lengthy introductions because we're starting a little late. Although our panelists certainly deserve them today. I'm obviously honored to be hosting this incredible panel with, uh, that we're calling the activists. Um, and, uh, there are a number of people that um, that we have asked to be on here today, and the first that I'm going to introduce is uh, is let me start this video is Shoshana Zuboff, the uh, the amazing author of The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, uh, and the hold on I'm trying to. Uh, Shoshana, if you just want to turn on yes. your video, yes. great. Okay. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, we're all kind of, I know it's 18 months into this, but we're, I'm still like, I can't get my Bluetooth to sync. So I very much understand. The age of surveillance capitalism, the fight for the future, the human future of the new frontier of power, a professor emerita at Harvard Business School and um, an incredible activist and academic in this area. Uh, Mitali Jain is the deputy director of Reset Tech. Um, and which is an organization that works to attract long-term funding for civil society organizations engaged in the, uh, in the democracy and technology problem. Uh, she has worked for over two decades to hold corporations accountable for human rights abuses. Um, and we're really happy to have you here today, Mateli. Thank you for joining us. Uh, next, we have Tristan Harris. Uh, Tristan is the president and co-founder for the Center of Humane Technology, which advocates for humane technology uh, uh, for the common good. He is the co-host of the podcast, Your Undivided Attention, and the primary subject of the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. And he was previously inside, uh, worked inside Google, uh, specifically around um, Google Inbox. Uh, and we are going to be joined imminently by Francis, Hi. Well, Hi. that was perfect. Hi, Hi. Uh, by Francis Haugen. Uh, uh, the reason that we're here today and who you are likely to know by now is the whistleblower uh, for her work with the Wall Street Journal and her testimony before Congress this week. She's a data scientist and a forder, former product manager at Facebook. And so we're obviously here today to discuss the Facebook files, the documents that um, Francis has uh, made public and made part of like the public the public domain. And I'm looking forward to kind of talking about what's next. But first, I'd like to start the conversation with what was first. Um, and basically, I would, I've asked each of you to kind of prepare a little like set of introductory remarks, two to four minutes 
about what this moment was for you that made you become an activist in this area and how you kind of have seen yourself uh, grow since then. I know that's a lot to fit into two to four minutes, but uh, Shoshana, can we start with you? We sure can. And thanks so much for having me, Kate. Hello to everybody. So honored to be here with all of you. Uh, you know, while I was writing The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, the question of bearings, how do we lose and how do we regain our moral bearings, that became such a prominent theme for me when I look back now, it kind of runs through the book like a musical refrain, without our bearings, we cannot navigate the unknown. To reestablish our bearings in the Age of Surveillance Capitalism, I counseled a rebirth of astonishment and outrage. Frances Haugen is a woman who, if I may say so, Frances, has her bearings. I could not be more proud of you, Frances. I am honored to share this moment with you and with all of my incredible colleagues here tonight. So we're gathering around the campfire tonight and we're telling a new story. This is not a story about corporate concentrations of economic power or about dangerous products. It's a story about concentrations of a new kind of social power and its social harms. This power originates in the secretive, massive scale extraction of behavioral data. Corporations can now know us in infinite detail and transform that knowledge into the power to trigger, to tune, to target and shape what we know, feel, think, and more. Our outrage is turned to Facebook, a leader in the exercise of this new power. One no longer young man appears to write the music and we dance. This is an intolerable assault on the individual capabilities, the rights, societal processes, and institutions essential for democracy and human well-being. And yet, we do nothing. All right, I am going to answer your question, Kate. I've been studying this unfolding saga for 43 years. Anyone who's as good at math as I am, I can cut to the chase and say that started in the year 1978. In the old tale of the tortoise and the hare, I think it's pretty clear that I am not the hare. For most of those years, I felt like I was shouting underwater. Less so now, but still I wonder what will come of this moment of mobilized outrage. We have been here before, and not all of you will remember. Gmail, Street View, Beacon, and the closest comparison, Cambridge Analytica. That story had it all too. A courageous young whistleblower, a shadowy oligarch and his right-wing surrogates, leasing the machinery of surveillance capitalism's ad systems and pivoting it to political domination. Then there were the parliamentary inquiries, the congressional hearings. And what happened? Nothing. In fact, the information space, including Facebook, became decisively worse, more antisocial, more anti-democratic, and most tragically, more murderous. Why? My answer is this a lethal category error. We framed the debacle as a management failure at a single corporation, believing somehow that Facebook's supreme leader could be shamed into being nicer, more ethical, or somehow the right mix of regulations would solve the problem. We failed to grasp the awesome truth of a new surveillance-based economic order of information capture and control led by the big five tech empires, but now saturating nearly every economic sector. We cannot afford the same mistake. The time for democratic counter-revolution is upon us. This time, 
we have to lift the hood of surveillance capitalism, take aim at the illegitimate and destructive operations that have come to define a dystopian digital age and the new social power that vies with democracy over the very governance of our societies. Thank you for joining us. I'll stop here. And Kate, I'll pick up the thread at the close of our panel. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashana. Um, that was uh, the, I think that you have set the bar in bringing like just really the the absolute stakes uh, that are that we're faced with here, and uh, I I but I do endeavor just to bring a little bit of lightness to the conversation to point out that the automatic lights went off on Francis in the room that she was in while you were talking. <laughs> she was sitting in the dark, uh, so hopefully the fight the campfire uh, will will light her back up in a second and I'll we'll turn her video back on. Um, but Montalia, I'd love to go for, to you and hear um, and hear your kind of your start in activism in this area. Sure. So I, I can't come to these issues uh, from a slightly different background than most on this panel. I was a traditional human rights attorney who literally started my career after 9-11 defending John Walker Lind, known as the American Taliban, and later um, men indefinitely detained at Guantanamo Bay. But it is interesting because I started my career as America woke up to the creation of the modern American surveillance state. And I saw how the state brutalized people in my community and other minority communities in the name of national security. And it wasn't until a decade later that Ed Snowden really woke up most of the country to this kind of state spying. Um, but this was a reality many of us had known for some time. And as the surveillance state extended into a surveillance economy, I didn't know at that time that I would be returning um, to throw my hat into this fight. Um, at that point, I'd shifted gears to seeking uh, to hold companies accountable for human rights violations. Uh, specifically challenging mining companies for their destruction in communities around the world. And then I had my moment um, that really launched my entry into this uh, arena. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a campaign that uh, was my entry point to the world of disinformation and online tech harms. Assam, a small state in the Northeast of India was undergoing a process of updating its citizen register and Modi's BJP government had seized upon this process to further disenfranchise minorities, particularly mus Muslims, and civil society had warned that this process could be the biggest exercise in rendering millions of people stateless in the 21st century. And so I and my colleagues started investigating the hate and misinformation online within this context. So I effectively went from being a natural resource extraction activist to a data extraction activist. And what I saw online then still haunts me now. Graphic images of Muslim individuals being beaten, taunted, videos of lynchings by Hindu supremacist mobs, and sometimes elected officials openly participating in fanning these flames of a genocidal variety of hate, referring to entire communities as vermin and cockroaches, and Facebook failing to act, its products repeatedly failing entire communities. And that's when I decided to roll up my sleeves and really get into this fight and bring together my background and experience in law, in holding corporations to account and in fighting the surveillance state um, and to push hard for the adoption of meaningful regulation that could curb this unchecked power and effectively subvert the business model of big tech. I knew from my investigation uh, in, into hate speech in India that content moderation would not be the panacea that would get us out of this mess, that we really needed to focus on meaningful data access and enforcement of privacy regulations, de-risking design and detoxing algorithms, systemic risk assessments and, and audits, and that we needed to focus on where we could get this done. And all I think right now we're in a catalytic moment where all of these reforms and more are being carefully considered and discussed within the frameworks of the Digital Services Act in the EU and the online safety bill in the UK. And we really need to push for our own lawmakers here in the US to sit up and take notice and to import these concepts uh, into the US. Along the way, I also met other courageous whistleblowers that, that came before Francis, Yael Eisenstadt, Sophie Zhang, Ifioma Ozoma, Dr. Timnit Gebru, to name a few. And I knew that if they could come forward at such great personal and professional risk, I had 
no excuse whatsoever to not use the platforms I had access to to push for more of them to come forward in safety and elevate the need for enhanced whistleblower protections and tech reform. And so that is how I got here. And it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you for the invitation. That was that was a beautiful um, that was a beautiful uh, history, Natalia, and I was really honored to hear it. And Tristan, um, love to hear your story. Some of us are familiar with it, but it would be great for you to summarize. Yeah, sure. Well, um, like everyone said, it's just a true honor. Oops, my video is clipping out and out. You can see me now. Um, it's a true honor to be with uh, these incredible uh, panelists um, and. Uh, see Shoshana again after the launch of The Social Dilemma. Uh, excited to talk more later. Um, and to honor Frances, who, um, watching her testimony, I'm sure that it is a feeling that many people in the audience share, but uh, it made me really emotional working on this topic for about eight years to see someone who can so eloquently speak about the issues that are facing all of us and to put forward the receipts of what so many people had been um, you know, saying for a long time, you know, it's so easy, I think, when we um, talk about polarization or teen mental health, they become lines of rhetoric, phrases that we use all the time. And I think Francis's testimony put, put real meat on the bones of the real world effects of these things. Uh, we saw Congress members really uh, affected at deep personal levels, you know, and there, I think that's actually why, you know, people dismiss the teen mental health thing as just kind of one of the political things to get this done, but it's I think Congress members themselves, when I brief members of Congress, uh, they focus on that issue because they have their own teenagers who are affected by these things in very significant ways. And I just just want to honor uh, what Francis did <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm so blown away and it took incredible courage for her to do what she did. Um, as far as my own story, I think people are familiar uh, on some level. Um, uh, I was a magician as a kid and I became very interested in, in the, the way that the mind is persuaded by things that it can't see. Um, studied meditation and uh, behavioral economics and sort of a 21st century view of the persuadability of minds. Um, famously was part of a, a class at Stanford called the Stanford Behavior Design or Persuasive Technology uh, Lab in class taught by Professor B.J. Fogg and became aware of a growing uh, fallacy. Uh, I would see the moral and ethical judgment of people who are taking classes that gave them the tools to influence human behavior at scale use very weak, inadequate arguments about how to wield that kind of power. And that's what alarmed me, uh, learning that material back in the day at Stanford at, at 22. And then later uh, in my own story, my own kind of awakening or uh, working on these topics, um, I thought that there was a kind of philosophical error that was at the core of the engagement economy. Um, because in a view of rational actors, we view that, and Facebook to this day, and as, as well as other companies, uses this argument that we're simply giving people what they want or what you're interested in. I mean, after all, didn't you choose your friends? Didn't you pick those articles that you're sharing and clicking and sharing and liking? Um, and I like to say that Facebook designs its products with 21st century behavioral economics and defends itself on Capitol Hill with 20th century neoliberal classical economics. Um, that it uses the notion of a rational actor to defend itself, uh, free speech, um, you know, free choice, uh, while actually designing its products with maximum persuasion. And I think the fallacy that brings me here, um, uh, and actually a lot of people don't know this, but um, and I think it actually is an important part of the story. I had my own startup company that made this, this fallacy. It was called Apture, and it, that's how I got to Google. Well, Google acquired it. And we sold something to publishers that we, we thought we were helping people learn about things that provided these little mini explanations. So when you wanted to click on something um, or you wanted to know more about something, it was sort of a tell me more button for the internet and provided these multimedia explanations. And we would do workshop deals, excuse me, uh, like business deals with like the New York Times and The Economist. And they would ask us one question. We'd sell it to them on, this is gonna increase reader curiosity, reader learning, um, it's gonna be great. And at the end of the day, they would say, um, well, how much is it increasing the amount of time on my website? And how much is it increasing the amount of revenue I make on my website? And as the founder of the company, I kind of empathize with um, at a much smaller scale where Zuckerberg is at, because I had a narrative about what I was doing. I was providing learning experiences for people. But at the end of the day, I was measured in this other currency, which was how much engagement did I generate for the New York Times and Washington Post. And it was that fallacy that I had actually a whole team of people. I had 12 people working under me that were submitting their lives to you know my decisions and you know their well-being and their salaries and so on and i was basically in the illusion that 
we were trying to increase learning online when really we were in the business as measured by the metrics as what we're doing for engagement. And that fallacy, people need to know this actually, that, that that's what motivates my, my own work, I think, in this, which is it's so easy to make the mistake of telling yourself the narrative your whole life that you have been uh, in, you know, helping people connect with their friends, making the world more open and connected, helping people learn about things, helping people find you know, so social support. But at the end of the day, the metrics are what sort of determine the system that you're building. And what is so powerful about the receipts that Francis bravely put forward from, from Facebook is how much those metrics uh, have distorted and warped every single aspect of our society through that same philosophical fallacy, that what is engaging is what is good. Um, and I hope that we go deeper into that. I have a lot more to say because I think fundamentally we have to see that the engagement model of an AI pointed at your brain with personalized, whatever would get you to click, doesn't just sort for the race to the bottom of the brainstem and what's polarizing, but that that polarization is actually incompatible with democracy. Because if you create a more extreme base of people who believe more extreme things because that was engaging for them, then political leaders, as, face, as Francis showed in her documents, uh, the political leaders in Europe and everywhere else around the world have to cater to a more extreme base and profit at a personal political level from saying more extreme things and getting elected from more extreme positions, which means that democracy doesn't work because you never get synthesis. Uh, and that fundamentally breaks democracy. When an oil company has an oil spill, uh, it, it doesn't weaken, it, it's a horrible externality, but the oil spill didn't ruin the capacity for the US government to regulate oil spills. But every time Facebook has externalities of polarization, addiction, distraction, et cetera, it actually weakens the US government's capacity to regulate. So I hope we get more into those themes. I wanna keep it short, but I'm just honored to be here with such esteemed, incredible colleagues. Yeah, thank you, Tristan, that was, that was wonderful. Um, and I didn't know some of that, so that was great. Um, Francis, welcome. <laughs> it is, uh, it's great to have you here um, and hopefully the lights stay on. Uh, the, uh, I would love to hear, like if there was a moment, one moment that kind of like flipped a switch for you, if it was a gradual kind of decision, how you got here, I think everyone would love to hear that story. So please go ahead and tell us like, what was the thing that kind of made you, as you have told me um, in convert and like in text messages, just like pick a path of kind of civil disobedience. Hmm. Um, so I, I knew that misinformation was dangerous before I came to Facebook. So I, 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 had a, um, I got quite ill in 2014 and I had to relearn to walk. Um, it's been covered in my Wall Street Journal profile. And I had a, a, a close friend who um, was uh, my assistant. I had hired him to help me um, just get my life in order. Like I was weak enough that I couldn't carry heavy things, that kind of thing. And he took me walking every day uh, for months you know, he'd take me swimming five days a week. He like loved to lift and, and he taught me about macros and protein. And he got radicalized on the internet in 2016. And it was one of the more painful experiences of my life because this person was really, really important to me. And I watched him go from being this smart, funny, compassionate, college educated guy. Like he, he knew lots and still the, you know, a trickle drip of information um, that turned into a flood um, like pushed him to a place where he believed like George Soros was running the world economy and nothing I could do could like really pull him back from that ledge. And so when I had the opportunity to join to work on civic misinformation in 2019, I, I took that opportunity because like I, I didn't want anyone to feel that pain that I had, I had felt. And I, I wanted to do my, my best that in the run up to the 2020 election that we didn't see a repeat of 2016 where you, know, you had nation state actors distributing all sorts of things um, on the platform. Um, once I got there, it was an incredibly eye-opening experience because I thought Facebook was problematic in the United States, right? Like I'd seen the effects of it. Facebook is, the, the version we see in the United States is the most sanitized, clean version of Facebook. And I kept learning thing after thing after thing, like, you know, uh, I, I didn't have an appreciation for the scale of how many people die from, from um, ethnic violence that's fanned by um choices that Facebook makes on the platform or, or Facebook's choices to underinvest in security systems for people who don't speak, say, English. Um, and as I learned more about the company and, and how it was operating, I, I began to have less and less faith that it could be corrected internally because of how the company itself was run. Um, the moment that kind of pushed me over the edge where I was like, well, I, it is clear to me that, that, that um, this will not be solved internally. 
Um, like I didn't know how I would bring information to the public, but I knew that I was going to have to do something. It was when they disbanded the civic integrity team after the 2020, the U.S. 2020 election. Um, because like, you know, Facebook said, you know, civic integrity is so important. We need to incorporate it into all the parts of our operation. Um, but many, many, many of the people who worked on civic integrity had, had quit the company by so even six months after that event. Um, in, including everyone who was in my immediate pod of product managers, like all of them, all, all of them left either the, our team or left the company within a six week span in around May, um, 2020, 2021, excuse me. Um, and so that, that's what brought me here is that I saw that, um, you know, what we see in Myanmar and what we see in Ethiopia are only the opening chapters of, of, a, of a, a novel that has an ending that is far scarier than any of us want to read. Um, these are not these are not novel experiences. These are things that we see over and over again in different levels of intensity around the world. And um, I believe that we still have time to be able to have social media that that brings out the best in humanity. But that that's not going to come about unless we help guide Facebook in that direction and we change the incentives. Great. I and that actually leads perfectly to my first question uh, for you. So, um, in the last few weeks. Since mm -hmm. the journal articles came out, since the, well, it has been mm -hmm. a few weeks, but the last few days yeah. since the testimony came out, um, there have been a lot of different people from like a lot of different ideologies laying claim to you, to put, to mm -hmm. just put it frankly, to like laying claim to you and to like laying claim to your facts that you bring forward and laying claim to your stories. And I like, as kind of like a cert, like a, I try to be like kind of impartial and kind of survey the scene and it's very it's fascinating to kind of see like these two different like people who I think would never disagree both claim or never agree both saying that like she proved my point or this is what we've been saying forever um and one of the things a couple I'll just sum up a couple of them a lot of people saying that you're anti-Facebook that you're anti-big tech right um a lot of people saying that um that in the political sphere saying that the American right is unfair, you're proving that the American right is unfairly censored on like social media. Um, and then there's, you know, and then other people kind of saying that like even your actions were an example of kind of a call out culture and not a whistleblower type of action. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to give you a chance to kind of just directly or, like respond to some of that and to like say it in your own words, kind of whether hmm. like what what's kind of happened in the last couple of um, in the last couple of weeks and kind of what, I don't know how much of that you've read, but I'm sure you're aware of some of it. And so uh, I'm just kind of thought I'd turn that over to you. Um, I, I really don't view this as a political issue. Like I think what Tristan flagged is like really the fundamental, if, if there is a political narrative, that should be the fundamental political narrative, which is when there's an oil spill, it doesn't decrease the ability of an, of the government to regulate oil firms. But as Facebook decays, it actually, and, and, and in the process decays our information environment or, or inflames our inflames us towards more extreme and, and divisive positions, it actually hurts our ability to ever regulate Facebook. Um, and so I view it as a bipartisan issue. Like this is a thing where, you know, if we wanna live in a society where we treat each other with respect, if we, if we don't wanna cancel culture, we need to not have systems of information that, pri that choose for us what to focus on and choose based on anger and and and, and um, extreme positions. Um, a lot of the coverage has been really really positive. Like I, the thing that I've I've been really really happy with is I've seen people on both sides of the aisle say things like, um, I, like it's not just that people everyone seems to think that I am validating something about what they're saying, um, but but people are also coming out and say like, hey, we never agree on anything. Like we all want to we all would like to reign in Facebook. Um, I think there's also really interesting grounds for cooperation. So like um, some people on the right have said, uh, she's she's a dark horse, she wants to censor us. Um, and it's so funny for me because I literally said in my testimony in front of the Senate, I don't believe that the solution is gonna be picking good ideas and bad ideas. Because any system that has to pick good ideas and bad ideas is a language-based system. And beyond the fact that those don't work, Right, that Facebook's own documents say best case scenario for violence inciting content, hate speech, you're only gonna get 10 to 20% of the content. And that's if we do a huge investment, right? So beyond the fact that they just don't work, 
if we want to protect the most vulnerable people in the world, so that's people who live in places at risk for ethnic violence, we can't have language-based systems because those places are linguistically diverse. So we look at a place like Ethiopia and there's six languages there. There's 100 million people, six languages. Even with people starting to die there from this, Facebook only supports two of those languages. And the economics just doesn't work. If we use systems that are per language based, they're not gonna scale to the most fragile people in the, people in the most fragile places in the world. So I feel like this is a thing people on the right and the left could come together, right? Like, you know, chronological ranking with maybe some spam demotion um, is a safer thing that will protect more people and everyone on the right who's worried about being censored, there's less, less of that fear there then. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. And I'm just going to take a moment to kind of like have you mm -hmm. expound on it a little bit more, um, because I think that this is key. I, first of all, I think that people assume that the apps, the scale that they're, and this is impossible at the scale they're doing this, but that, that the, that there is the, the platforms can read everything to, to put it like, mm. another, to, like so that they're able to look at the content and that they're not looking at the behavior of the content, how hmm. it's being shared, how it's moving, how it's being amplified or how it's going around. And they're not making decisions based on that. And I think, and I'm interested to hear, um, you know, Tristan, if you agree with this um, or, or um, and Francis, obviously, if you agree with this, but this idea that like, I think that our, our, our basic levels of content moderation started with getting rid of spam and getting rid of pornography, which were both shared and that ended up being behaviorally based not pornography as much that's still hard to like police but spam is very behavioral that's like how they track it and figure out how to mm -hmm. take it down and so one of the things um you know that tristan just said is kind of this idea that there's not good or bad but like that, that and the idea of just pure growth or pure engagement as being a net good is not is not true like neither are these platforms necessarily making good or bad decisions or only optimizing for this one metric so i'm very curious what do you see do you see a behavioral solution to this problem um from the from the company mm -hmm. or do you see this coming from having to come from some type of external regulation to force them to take a behavioral solution to mm. this problem um, a lot of the reason why they haven't, so there's, there's lots and lots of behavioral based solutions that are flagged within the documents. Um, the, the thing that has kept Facebook from, um, so to give you an example, uh, reshare chains. So like, let's say you write something, I reshare it, Mitali shares it. That's two hops long. If it shows up in Shoshana's feed, if she, the shoe at that point would have to copy and paste it before it would go on, right? She's, she's not being oppressed, right? Copy and pasting is not oppression. Um, I, but changes like that, really simple ones that reduce virality, that's a behavioral and build in friction function. and build in friction. It gives people a chance to think like, do I want, do I care about this thing enough to keep pushing it along? Um, those kinds of changes radically decrease the amount of misinformation on the platform, right? Like on, on a similar par, uh, like scale with like the entire third-party fact-checking program. Um, and so, but the problem is changes like that also hurt growth for Facebook by tiny little bits, you know, we're talking 0.2% of sessions, that kind of thing. And part of it also is that some countries in the world don't have as much original content production. So there are some countries where 35% of everything shown in the feed is a reshare. And so Facebook's very um, protective of that vir virality, because instead of trying to get us to create more original content, they're just recycling this old content, even though it has negative consequences. That's a great point. Does anyone want to add anything? I'm happy to let other people um, follow up. Tristan? I just think <clears throat> what Francis said is, is so important. First of all, it's pointing to one very, very short term, um, not solution, but at least to make it a lot safer, which is, you know, we could make a change right now. I mean, it's literally a couple lines of code for them to say something like, you know, that reshare button goes away after it gets shared twice. And the second thing Francis said, I want to make sure people get it because it's it's so important, you know, we, we think that social media is bad in the West and in, in the US and all the polarization dynamics. But if you're in one of these developing countries and, you know, most of your feed is these like 20 chain long res reshares, right? You get these basically conspiracy. I mean, the, the, the evidence in Facebook's documents is that uh, the longer something gets reshared, like the thing that gets reshared 20 times, the more likely it is to be misinformation, toxic information, bad, bad stuff, right? And so, but the reason that they do that is that if people are posting not so much, not so often in some of these countries, then you go to your Facebook feed and there's nothing there. 
And so this is a decision that's based purely on growth. And so you have to imagine like empathizing, I'm, I'm opening my feed in you know, Ethiopia or a place where there's actually you know, conflict. I'm seeing all just the worst stuff um, and what that experience is like. And then just like climate change where you know, the developing world gets the worst of it. I mean, the resources, most of the resources on content moderation, uh, which we know actually only has a side effect of polarizing people more, especially in polarized societies. Most of those resources though, are spent in English speaking countries or Western countries. Um, and even Avaz did a great um, sort of diagram of uh, sort of a justice denied is justice delayed that basically the number of days it takes to sort of fact check some of the worst misinformation in English is like one or two days. And then if you're in French, it's like, you know, four or five days. And then if you're in Italian, it's like 20 days. And so then you go wait, you get to the long tail uh, and you start to see how this is just kind of a dangerous thing. And just to say, nowhere is it written that our society needs virality. You know, why, why do we need that thing? You know, there's a story, I'll just share one quick story because someone told me this about, about Apple um, back in the day that when Steve Jobs has shown the, an updated version of the podcast app where someone said, hey, what if we made there was a feed? And so you could see what your friends were listening to, which podcast episodes and you could like and you could comment, basically turning the podcast app into a, so, a social network. And my understanding from this person is that Steve responded, no, that's a ridiculous idea. Why would you do that? Because if something was actually genuinely worth someone else's attention, which is the most precious thing on earth, people would copy the link and then send it by a text. And I think some of the best things and most important things that we needed to know, someone you know, texted and shared that thing. Now I know in saying this, there's a lot of people who don't like this because what virality does, essentially it opens up the variance quadrant. It says, hey, we're gonna get a lot more QAnons and we're gonna lock a lot more Satoshi Anons, right? We're gonna get, Gun gum style, and we're all going to laugh more, right? And so we're gonna, but you're opening up the variance thing. But I think the question is, and, and Facebook and, and Twitter and everyone else will always point out the positive things that come from that variance, um, the positive viral videos, the keyboard cat, whatever it is. But on the other side of the balance sheet is stuff that breaks down the democracy into not working at all. And so saying that we need to open up that variance and being blind faith on variance is like saying, let's just you know, dump Chernobyl radiation on the world because it'll increase the variance of human genetics and we'll get nine foot tall humans sometimes. It's not worth it when you irradiate the entire population. So I think sure. that's, that's a core thing. No, no, I, 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 I think that this is a great point. And so I actually want to follow up on what you just said. Um, so I think that this is correct. I think that the, uh, I mean, I mean, I am not the only one, uh, <laughs> that there is this idea that like, that this is, that the way that the engagement is happening is like, yes, you might laugh more, but there are fundamentally some things that are being, a lot of things about our society and democracy and public health that are being eroded. And I think that that's, I think that that's correct. But here is something that like Facebook would say in response to this, or that the platforms would say in response to this, that kind of directly speaks to that point. It's like the number of people who have like, engaged in organized and democratic protest or have um, been able to run um, with low, and, and I'm not trying, okay, of course I'm not being an apologist here for the companies, but I think that these are actually really real positives of what uh, the internet and social media brings us. People who don't have the coffers to run a huge local campaign have access to low, um, low cost uh, ads targeted specifically in their local demographic. And I want to point out that that's really most valuable in other parts of the world that are that and other places where people have a hard time reaching mass audiences. And I think that some of these things are the things that are either mythologized or are underrated or are like, no, are, I can't tell whether they're under or overrated, I guess is what I'm hmm. saying. And I think a lot of the world can't. And one of the things that Francis has talked so eloquently about um, and it was the first, you know, it was the first installment of um, Jeff's, uh, Jeff Horowitz's Wall Street Journal series was the, was like really the metrics and what we've talked about so far, this idea of just user engagement. So what about building a better metric? What about being able yeah. to build something good to measure along with the bad, not the puppy videos, but mm. like the democratic engagement yeah. versus like the democratic erosion. And Francis, can you speak to that? Well, just before we go on to that, I want to address your your like we're gonna have to give up Black Lives Matters. We're gonna have to give up the Egyptian Revolution thing. I just want to, I, I I really don't want this to be a false choice on that one. Um, yeah. One of the things that I was most struck by um, uh, relatively soon after I joined, I learned about um, what happened. So Pantsuit Nation, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was a private Facebook group that uh, grew extremely rapidly. Um, after the election of, of Donald Trump. 
And, um, and the thing that was fascinating about this group and, and kind of like really shaped a lot of my feelings about like, you know, this question on virality, right? Um, because people have said like, oh, like, you know, um, we need, we, we shouldn't reduce virality. Like things need to grow as fast as possible. So Pantsuit Nation was not optimized to grow, right? It got to something like 12 million members in like two weeks. But it wasn't optimized for growth. You had to be invited by someone. Like someone had to let you into the group to get added to it. Um, and the thing that that really struck upon me was uh, ideas whose time has come. Like in a world where you get two hops of reshares, ideas can still grow really, really fast with two hops of reshares, right? Like if I have, you know, I have a couple thousand friends on Facebook. If I reshare it, if a very small number of those people reshare it, it gets a even just my first posting goes out to tens of thousands of people. And so that that's the thing. It's we're not saying you can either have social movements or you can have uh, or have problems with virality. It, so I just want to make sure we don't um, consider. No, that as I like specifically a, like was hoping it. someone yeah. would complicate the false yeah. choice yeah. that everyone is being provided is yeah. being given, and that was a really good. I think that that was a really good example of it. Tristan, did you want to add anything? No, I think that's that's exactly right. Um, which is to say, what are you know, safer levels of virality where we can get mm -hmm. some things to go viral at some coefficient, but it's the difference between like the aggressive Delta variant of COVID and these exactly. more innocuous variants yeah. that die in the crib, right? I yeah. mean, it's, we're just talking about our knots and we have the Zuckerberg vir Virality, you know, Institute and the TikTok Virality Institute. And for all of them, it actually matters how viral do we want our society uh, to be? I would say just one thing, and I think other people should really speak mm -hmm. is, um, you know, uh, rights come with responsibilities mm. and we have decoupled uh, power from responsibility. So just handing out viral megaphones without coupling it with what are the responsibilities of someone who is going to speak to that many people? The, in other places in our society, the greater the power you have, the greater the responsibility. A doctor has greater power, they have a Hippocratic Oath, and because they have so much power in an entangled relationship with you because they have all your personal inf information, they know this is Jack Balkins and, and Jonathan Zetrain's argument. I have all the privileged information on you. I can make if I tell you or give you advice on, on medicine, you're going to take my advice. The amount of power that I have, I mean, plus the fact that I have a prediction engine, so taking Shoshana's work now, and I can basically have a supercomputer. So I've said this before, but if, if I'm a priest and I've listened to 2 billion people's confessions, and it's worse than that because I have a supercomputer next to me that can predict the confession you're going to make before you know you're going to make it. In other words, I know things about you you don't know about yourself. That power has responsibility. And when you have that degree of asymmetry, that power can only be in law in service of the person with much less uh, power. Uh, so I sort of slipped the argument I was making there because it originally starting with the power of broadcast or viral, uh, viral speech to the power of technology platforms and the asymmetric influence that they have. Um, but I wanna let other people speak. I just think that's, that's another sort of uh, nuance to add to the conversation. Yeah, Mentali, I kind of wanted to bring you in here. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we're talking about and we, and was huge about the, the the Facebook files and some of what we've seen is the the disproportionate attention that um, that the rest that the rest of world as they as they literally put it on the on as they literally term it on the ten Ks uh, gets compared to compared to the U S the the disproportionate amount of time and attention um, and the disproportionate amount of harms that are felt I would remind everyone that nine percent of Facebook users are based in the US. Um, and every time I'm giving a talk and I give that, like, I give that tidbit to a US audience, they like literally gasp. And when I give it in a in a in a global audience, literally anywhere else in the world, they're just kind of like nod knowingly. Um, but I just kind of like to point that out. And so Matali, do you see something? Um, do you see something kind of what we're talking about in the metrics? Do you think that there that that is where the change could happen? Or do you think that this has to be a broader policy commitment, a broader pro product change from the company to decide to do better in places where it's not going to have an immediate economic payoff? So again, just to complicate the false choice, I don't think it's either or, I think it's both end. Um, I mean, I think we need to be, thinking about the shorter term uh, solutions that the companies can take right now, whilst we continue to push for external regulation that would create more systemic um, change. Um, and so I, I really see the efforts have to be at multiple levels um, and, and the, the kinds of uh, 
tweaks. I mean, frankly, the changes that Francis and Tristan are talking about are things that can happen in the more uh, immediate short term. And, you know, there, there's already some precedent for it. I mean, we can talk about the fact that, for example, uh, WhatsApp kind of limiting its its forwards, um, you know, to, to five or what not is not enough, but it certainly has had an effect. And I think that's the type of thing that we're talking about in terms of slowing virality. Um, and uh, just looking at, and it doesn't prevent, obviously, friends and family groups uh, from flourishing on, on WhatsApp. It's just really a measure to kind of try to slow things down and to prevent the, the worst actors from gaming the systems um, as they will. So yeah, I, I think we need to be pushing for both of those things and more. I mean, we need to also be pushing for paradigmatic cultural shifts um, in, in how we think about technology and democracy and our relationship to them. So there's, there's change that's required at multiple levels. So Francis, you'd kind of had said that you'd come back to kind of the question of how they would measure the good and the bad. And we were kind of hmm. talking about like, so I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that and what you think, where you think the measurement, measurements might come in and at like a practical level. Um, so they have some kinds of, so one, I think there's an important thing, which is Facebook should have to publish whatever harms they're currently tracking. Right, and um, they should have to have much more transparency around how do they define those harms, and like what is their accuracy at at defining those harms, because uh, our current mode of interaction is people on the outside see harms at Facebook, and uh, we have to try to like convince the company that these harms exist on the platform. Um, one of the advantages of having like a regulatory body that had oversight over Facebook is that we would have a mechanism for surfacing, and we believe these things are problems. Facebook needs to be transparent with us to demonstrate that this is actually not a harm on the platform. Um, once you have more transparency on what is the frequency of these problems, um, you know, I think there's ways of doing weighted measures around uh, what, what the relative harm is in aggregate. Um, there's certain things where you can focus on how do you promote the good on a civic side. So for example, um, they have a concept known as, as positive motifs um, or diverse positive motifs. So the idea that people who are good at um, speaking to um, diverse audiences, so that's people on the left and the right about civic issues, that takes a lot of effort, right? Like right now, we don't reward in engagement-based ranking people who are good at being thoughtful and presenting things in a way that diverse people can listen to them. Um, but there are ways to model that diversity, like the fact that your audiences are composed of, of not just people on the left or just people on the right, and be able to understand, like, do you um, lead to positive conversations, like the ability for people to go back and forth in ways that are constructive. And I think it'd be interesting, like, what, what if we did optimize more or, like, try to, over time, have a larger volume of these conversations? Because that's the thing that we, we could be bowling on. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point. Um, I as was going to go, Shoshana, are you, um, I was hoping that I could ask you, um, as you have been in this space for since 1978, as you outed yourself, I wasn't going to out you, uh, but uh, that since 1978, um, and you have been so informative in shaping public knowledge about this from, from the days of speaking underwater, do you feel like there has been a change um, in the last couple of weeks? And I mean, you did you you brought up the, the the recent events that have caused similar moments of awareness and coming around to things. Do you think we're approaching a moment in which we're in a position as a society to kind of capitalize on the knowledge that Francis has kind of brought us and that we've learned over the last couple of from the documents that she's produced or gathered? You're muted. Let me make sure you, there you go. Oh, no, you're still muted. You should be getting, there you okay. go. Okay, we're good. I actually believe that this, um, this um, sea change uh, has been happening uh, over the last couple of years, and that uh, even before uh, this um, marvelous intervention that Francis has made and all of the powerful discussions that have come out of it, 
um, where we're seeing for the, for the first time in the last two decades, issues that have been considered settled, undiscussable, are being discussed and are, and are suddenly regarded as not settled at all. We're seeing substantial legislative activity in the EU and um, legislative acts, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the um, Democratic Governance of AI. These are legislative proposals that um, together with the amendments that members of the European Parliament are, are adding to these proposals for the first time offer the, the promise of beginning to shift the directory, the, the direction, I'm sorry, to shift the trajectory, <laughs> to shift our direction toward a democratic digital future. Not all of the solutions, uh, not all of the final answers, but to begin to make this shift so that we establish the principle that the digital lives in democracy's house. And quite frankly, when I when I hear you discussing, you know, the the mechanisms of, of virality and friction and so forth, my response to that is that these are essential conversations, but they cannot be relegated to the realms of private capital. These are conversations that have to be held among citizens and lawmakers uh, as we craft a digital and democratic century. So uh, as much as, as we can urge Facebook to tweak, uh, that is not the solution. The solution is that the digital has to live in democracy's house. And um, in my final remarks, actually, Kate, you know, this is something I wanna develop a little bit, but, um, you know, for now I would say, um, look at what's happened in the EU and the discussions that are happening there. And then Eureka in Washington DC, among our, our Congress folks, our senators, we are having discussions that have never been held before. Not only that, but we see our lawmakers engaging in these discussions with a kind of grasp and perspicacity that they have never evidenced before. We compare to Cambridge Analytica, the hearings on misinformation on March 24th of this year, um, we heard uh, the, the uh, members of the committees that were, that were interrogating the tech executives, you know, we heard them saying, look, we know that this is an economic logic that is driving misinformation. And we are no longer going to be bamboozled by your constant excuses and gaslighting and all of that. And I'm kind of paraphrasing, but this is the essence of, of what we said. You know, we heard um, Congresswoman Eshoo uh, uh, talk about introducing a ban on surveillance advertising. And uh, we have the same discussions about banning surveillance advertising happening now in Europe and happening within civil society. As you may know, Accountable Tech just um, last week, the week before, um, issued a formal petition to the Federal Trade Commission uh, on the subject of banning surveillance advertising. So in all kinds of ways, we're seeing civil society and lawmakers on both sides of the Atlantic converging on issues that most people have, dis have, have considered you know, something that we can't even breach, that we can't even talk about. And certainly when I first went out to talk about my book in January of 2019, uh, which turned into a, a long journey that has never stopped, but right in those early days, the idea that we would ban surveillance advertising, honestly, people looked at me, you know, like I had three heads or more, nine. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that the that's train has left the station, the toothpaste is out of the tube. And what Francis is doing brilliantly is accelerating, adding power and a whole lot of um, crucial documentation to this, uh, to this um, uh, whole new zeitgeist. Yeah, 
I think that that's very well put. And it's, it's actually, it gives me a little bit of optimism, Shoshana, that maybe like, maybe, yeah, that maybe that thing. I'm totally opt. I am nothing but optimistic. Great. This is moving. This is changing. This is what democracy does. We know how to do this. And it's uncomfortable. Like it's very uncomfortable uh, for everyone and a little bit, it's about to get a lot more uncomfortable for the tech companies, I think. Um, so I'm gonna go to Q and A simply because we have just outstanding questions from all over the world. Um, and uh, I think they raise tremendous points. And this is for, I'm gonna delegate it to Francis and Mitali. Um, and it's from, uh, I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce your name because I do not speak Spanish. Uh, from Jose Arazura, a professor for philosophy at the University in Chile. Uh, a question for, from a developing country. Because digital technology is not, a locally, is not locally produced mm -hmm. in developing countries, which I think is a tremendous um, kind of commentary on the aspects of kind of how we have exported US norms. So I'm, this is not his question. This is just like, I'm just kind of ad-libbing here a little bit about the, that part of that we don't talk about enough. Um, we cannot hope to develop top-down strategies to tame digital technologies. Do you activists believe the bottom-up strategies are viable in order to improve our control over our digital lives? I'm thinking here about education, public education that could correct the digital illiteracy of our populations. And in parentheses, he adds, our generation has self-taught itself into digital life. I mean, I think a lot of us have self-taught ourselves into digital life, but maybe more so in Chile. So, uh, but Francis, uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, I think he's flagging a really, really important concern, um, which is Facebook knows who can regulate it, right? The reason why they're spending, I think it's like 87% of their misinformation budget on, the, on English when uh, you know it's actually seven percent of its users are in the United States, it's not even nine percent. Um, it's it's crazy. Like the reason why they're doing that is because you know if 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 people think that Facebook is unsafe in the United States, they'll regulate it. Um, so it becomes this interesting question of like, how do we deal with this, right? So Facebook's extracting all this money from the rest of the world and then gives no control back to the rest of the world. I think the, the most basic thing that can be done, because this is something that is in the hands of people in Chile or other countries, is that some countries, particularly ones that are like say in close proximity to places like Russia or often China, um, have gone and developed um, um, uh, misinformation campaigns and ways of uh, inoculating the populace uh, with the kinds of attitudes and things to look for to at least decrease the impact of misinformation. because those countries have realized this is a national security issue when they are so close to powers that, that, that do regularly weaponize these platforms. Um, at the same time, I, I, I feel like that's a little victim blaming, blaming for me to be like, oh, you should go and educate your populace because you know Facebook is doing these things. Um, I think the secondary thing is, I think we do need to do movement building in the United States that is based around the idea of like, you know, we have more access to Facebook to demand change. Um, and that this is one of those things where like, um, you know, I part, a big part of what motivated me to come forward was, you know, I was worried that there were hundreds of thousands or millions of lives on the line in, in places that would never have an ability to counter Facebook. But I knew that I had the capacity to act, right? Um, and I think it's a thing of, we need more both individuals outside of tech companies putting pressure on legislators to care about these issues. And we need employees inside of companies speaking up for these users who, who, who don't have any other way of protecting themselves. That's a great point, Mitali. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Couldn't agree with Francis more. And I'm, I'm ever grateful to Francis, to you for um, using the platform you have to really draw attention to this. Because I think it is no uh, secret that the worst harms of Facebook and other platforms are felt outside the US in exactly the communities that have the least political leverage to effectuate change. Um, and so it, it, it's incumbent upon us with our access and privilege in the so-called global north to really bring those perspectives, um, to bring those harms to the table and to accept our responsibility to, to tame our own beast, as it were, um, and, and really do what we can to bring those perspectives to both the, the companies and in meetings with executives and in meetings with lawmakers. 
So I couldn't agree with with that more. Um, and you know, in fact, I, I think uh, the to answer the question, the ground up approach again, I would never say it's not you know important. It's it's important, but digital literacy is important even in our communities right here at home. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the distinction between global south, global north is is a false one in that sense because um, you know there's a there's a heightened degree of tech literacy that that we all need, whether it's a mature de democracy or a fragile democracy. Um, uh, but I do think that the ground up approach suffers in one really key respect in a lot of these societies, which is that the very authoritarian governments that Facebook and others have propped up um, in terms of bringing them to power and maintaining their power um, are the governments that are quelling, that, that are quashing civil society and making it very um, difficult for people, communities, organizations to organize around tech reform. And I can speak you know, with personal experience in the process of uh, doing some investigations that we were doing in, in, in other countries. We had researchers who were arrested, who had to flee the country. Um, and so I think it's not insignificant that a lot of people on the ground are unable um, to really bring these issues to light in the ways that would be necessary to, to really effectuate you know, some kind of call to action from the ground, which makes it even more important for us to be doing this uh, here. Yeah, um, I have another, um, I mean, all of these are great questions, so maybe I should stop prefacing them with that, but Michael Kingston says, I'm a middle school teacher. I see the war for young people's attention and the unfolding young mental health crisis play out in my classroom every day. What role does the panel envis envisage for teachers and empowering young people? So I guess this is a little bit of a, of a personal responsibility or the role of educators and not the role of tech companies, but it also be, I think that we'd all be interested to hear both, um, in empowering young people to reshape their relationship with social media and addictive technology. Tristan, do you wanna start? I can try. Um, I haven't focused as much in the recent days on the how it affects young people. Um, this is a really hard one. I just empathize with educators and parents because um, what Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat have done is created a locked in communication channel so that you will be socially ostracized if you leave. I think people, a lot of people made this mistake and, and actually Frances said this in, so eloquently in her testimony that um, parents give their kids bad advice. And I think Facebook actually knows that because parents mm -hmm. know par parents don't know how this stuff works. So first, first of all, a lot of people don't know, for example, that um, if you're a teenager and you use say Instagram as your primary thing, um, that's your number one way to message people. So like for us, I imagine we all use text message, iMessage on a on iPhone or something like that, or Signal, something like that. But if you're a kid and the sort of engagement machine of body dysmorphia and the TikTok influencer machine of viral memes, those become, that becomes your primary communication medium. And you can't sort of cite, you know, uh, extract out the messaging from the engagement machine. You have been, you know, uh, locked into this awful ecosystem. In fact, we used to say um, what makes current, the current situation inhumane is that we're forced to use platforms that are so toxic and that there's actually no easy way to kind of get out of that. And I think, Francis, you said in your testimony that you would prefer a world where people don't even use social media until over 18. I, I happen to agree. I don't know if I would say I make that a law, but I think it's interesting and I think it's provocative and I think it's the direction that we should consider going. I don't think that we would be better off. And I, I love what Shoshana said about um, digital lives in democracy's house um, or in well being's house. And I feel like when we had Sesame Street growing up, we had child psychologists designing children's education from, with everything they know about child psychology, but not to manipulate kids, but to try to create the most enriching and learning oriented experience and compassion oriented experience. Um, and we don't, we don't have that. Um, and it's important to say one last thing. Um, China has recently taken some very broad steps with regard to how children use it, its platforms. Um, for, if you're under the age of, uh, I think it's 14, uh, TikTok, you can only use it uh, for 40 minutes a day. And they actually, when you scroll, they give you museum exhibits, science experiments you can do at home, and patriotism videos, because they realize that digital lives in China's house, in the CCP's house, and they want their kids to be astronauts. And we take our hand off the steering wheel and allow Instagram and TikTok to teach our kids to be influencers. And which of those societies, you know, do you want to live in and, and sort of what it looks like? I don't mean we should adopt the China model, just to be really clear. 
I'm not saying that. Yeah, but the how? But what are you saying then? <laughs> because that sounds very paternalistic, frankly. Like, I mean, it's one thing to give the option of Sesame Street. It is like a very, a very, and also have Bugs Bunny. It's a very different thing to have kind of like, to be having Facebook force you to eat broccoli. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm li- I'm just actually, I really am curious what you mean. Totally. Sorry, to be really clear, I'm not suggesting that there should be an authoritarian regulation like that here in the States. That should be a democratic conversation. That's what it should be. I do think Apple has an interesting role in giving parents much better tools to control their, their kids' use. Um, and uh, I was going to say one more other thing, but I, I think I forgot. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let other others answer the rest. Yeah, Francis, do you want to pop in? Um, so I think on a, like to go back to the original question of like what what's the role for schools? Um, one, like so Tristan hit on a really important thing, which is that Facebook's own research says kids feel profoundly alone when they struggle with the problems they're facing. And for those who don't have children or haven't been exposed to what teenagers are experiencing, the experience of being a teenager today is very, very different than it was for even when I was a teenager, which was not really that long ago. Um, it used to be that it didn't matter how bad school was, you could go home at the end of the day. And for the vast majority of kids who have good home lives, um, they got a break. You know, it didn't matter how bad you got bullied, you got a, a solid 16 hours to reset before you went back into the fray. And now that bullying or that harassment follows kids into their bedrooms. Like the last thing kids see before they fall asleep at night is someone being cruel to them, or they wake up in the morning into some horrible slur about them or, or about their personality. And you know that really, really wears kids down. And and Facebook knows that parents don't have the right context about um, neurological development. They don't have the right context on what is or isn't effective for coaching kids on um, on how to deal with these situations. And they give advice like, why don't you just turn off your phone? Why don't you just not use it? And the, the reality is that kids feel fear being ostracized. That's in Facebook stocks if they don't use the product. That kids say, I'm not, I know it doesn't make me happy. I know um, I, I'm not having fun. I know I don't want to use it, but I also feel like I can't stop. And so I think there's a real role for schools in um, uh, helping to pull together high quality information and make sure that every parent gets given that information regularly on like what is or isn't constructive in terms of how to coach and support your kids. Because um, right now parents are trying really hard and because they're, they, there's those gaps, those, those differences in lived experience, the parents just aren't in a really, aren't being set up to succeed and the parents are struggling just as much as the kids are. Kristen, do you wanna add something in? I also was gonna ask if you could, you said that you'd just been working on, you'd been working on children in the past, but I'd love it if you could tell us what we can also as adults know, like as, hmm. as to, in terms of like distant, not falling into these same habits and hmm. traps. I am, um, oh. You mean one, oh. One Go ahead, Shoshana, sorry. I think, I think, <laughs> Let's add a couple of dimensions to this discussion about school education. You know, there's a long thread and debate in education. Um, education should be developmental. Education should help children develop, you know, children develop. And when we're talking about the teens and the preteens that are the, the um, targets of, of these machine processes, we're talking about human beings who are at a moment in their, in their developmental lives where the only way that I exist is in the reflection of others. These are developmental processes you know, that are well, well documented, well established from the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, long before social media. What happens in social media is that these things are intensified exactly as you're describing them. Now we are so pegado, so, stru- so stuck into these systems, can't move out of these systems, that the spaces, the experiences, the human relationships in which normally in, in that part of uh, adolescence and early adulthood, normally we would be developing a self. We would be developing an internal reference space where it's not just what do they think I should do, but what do I think I should do? 
And um, what's happening is that that space has been uh, has been just filled and colonized by all of these processes that that have them stuck. So it's interfering in what have been considered, you know, healthy, normal developmental processes relevant to the modern age. We have to become selves to become autonomous citizens, people who can have opinions and vote and do all the things that we're supposed to do in a democratic society. So teacher, <laughs> what can schools do? What can teachers do? On the one hand, teachers are embattled right now from the same systems mm. because schools have become sites of surveillance almost as intense as workplaces students and faculty. And because um, teachers are saddled with Google Classroom, Google Education, this denatured, dehumanized uh, version of education uh, that, is, that is, you know, taking all of the relationship and all of the real learning out of school and delegating it to these systems because you know we're we're in an era where public uh, public institutions have been scraped to the bone for all of the reasons that we all understand neoliberalism blah 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 so teachers are really embattled and it takes perhaps not just a single teacher but a school and maybe a school system to say we're going to reinstitute the human and the relationship and the relational. One tiny last point, a Gallup poll several years ago, I never heard anybody mention it. <clears throat> it asked college students um, a few years after they had graduated, it asked them what were the most important elements in your college experience uh, that contributed to your well being and your success. And they expected, you know, um, oh, the great libraries and the great dormitories and the, um, you know, the swimming pools and all the things that universities and colleges are spending money on. Across the board, basically, all, the, all of these people who were defined as really successful and flourishing and having a lot of well-being, they all said the same thing, one thing. And they said it was having a relationship with a professor or a mentor who really believed in me, who really felt that I was special, who really felt that I had something special to contribute, that relationship changed everything, right? That's the developmental relationship. It doesn't cost much, but we have to free and empower our teachers in our schools to come back to the human center of education. Yeah, I think that's great. Tristan, I wanna give you a chance to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, what you I had asked before, but I, I love that point, um, Shoshana, and I think that it's it's a great kind of practical advice to kind of like also be thinking about other systems that we can reform besides just directly the tech platforms. Um, and how these all are working together and being kind of, and, and the influence that they're paddling between them. So I think that that's a great point. Tristan? Uh, no, I think what Shoshana said was was uh, perfect. And I, as a student of developmental psychology, and um, I just really recommend everyone read Neil Postman's book, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, because I think it just, it kind of said everything and, and we're all just living in the wake of it. Um, you know, I think it's just one last thing, it's just important to point out when Shoshana talked about the, the virtuality of my virtual self and what they think of me there, it's important to realize that part of the business model of engagement is creating these kinds of virtual social ties and virtual social pressure and virtual subject uh, feeling like other people are watching me because that's what creates the need that I have to go back in there and, and manage my virtual self. And so even the idea that we have a kind of virtual avatar that we have to manage is itself incentivized by this engagement economy. And if you wanna sort of zoom out and think about the kind of master of the universe play, it's not just attention or engagement, it's sort of creating the virtual metaverse, right? That's what they're all competing for, is to create that virtual world that owns as much of your time. And that's what the glasses are about. And that's what uh, all these things are about. Um, and so again, as, we, as Shoshana said so eloquent, eloquently, um, digital lives in democracy's house. It lives in societal values house. And I, I worry, if I'll say anything, since I know we're wrapping up too, that 
I think the important thing is to not just use this moment to get to slightly less toxic social media, but to ask what is a relationship between technology and democracy that gives us a stronger democracy? Because right now we can notice that China is uh, consciously uh, employing technology to make stronger autocracies. Uh, and they're basically using superstructure, their culture and social structure law to bind the power of infrastructure, which is technology. Uh, that's from Marvin Harris. Typically, when new infrastructure comes around, um, the free press uh, killed feudalism and it gave us democracy. But we have this new tech, this new AI powered curated engagement tech. That thing kills democracy in the same way that uh, the printing press kills feudalism, uh, unless you manage it with, with um, superstructure culture and social structure law. And so I think that the key thing is actually how do we have a world where democracies are consciously employing technology to create stronger and better democracies, not saying we're anti-technology because then China just builds you know, the, the other thing. Uh, we have to figure out that right relationship. But the premise of humane technology is to make sure, as Francis said so eloquently in her testimony, that it's human centric first. Yeah, I think that that's a wonderful point. If there is going to be this weaponization and this solidification of power for, from autocratic countries in the infrastructure and to encode their culture in the infrastructure and their society in the infrastructure, then why not do it for democracies instead of letting it undo itself? Uh, so I think that that's an, an, an amazing point. Um, so I we have time for one more question and then we're going to wrap. Um, and uh, I that question is going to be, um, from Professor Anat Alam Beck, is this part of a tech employee revolt or more? And do you foresee, I think this is a great question to end on, do you foresee more activism from tech employees? And so I'm going to pose this to Francis first and then um, kind of hear from everybody. But I think that this is, I think that this is a wonderful uh, kind of way to wrap up for today. Go ahead, Francis. Uh, one of the, the most common questions I've been asked by um, people in, in Congress and Senate is around, um, you know, what was my whistleblowing experience like and what support do, do whistleblowers need? And I think part of what has been driving that question is that, you know, a lot of these platforms, like just our larger technology companies, often have things about them that you can basically only learn about, like even just period learn about, not, not a question of like having skills where, you know, you might go to college and get a master's degree. These are literally topics where you can only learn about them at these places. Um, and so you, you end up in a situation where people on the outside, like people in the Senate can ask questions about Facebook, but they have to just kind of believe Facebook's answers because, you know, the level of understanding inside the company and outside the company is just completely, you know, out of whack. Um, and so I think there is a real need for whistleblowers to come forward. And um, I encourage you all to talk to someone like Whistleblower Aid, which is the, the legal aid group that has supported me throughout this entire thing. They're really wonderful. Um, they've never made me pay a dime. So go toss them some, they have a GoFundMe um, just to plug them. Um, and I, I think it's really important and, and because the whistleblowers are one of the only things that can actually give us even kind of a chance in terms of maintaining the autonomy of our democracies versus these large companies with network effects, right? They're gonna keep getting bigger, they're gonna keep being more profitable. The only way we stand kind of a chance is if individual employees stand up and if they see things where they think people's lives are on the line, they, they need to act. Um, one of the things that I'm really heartened by is um, there is movement right now to extend whistleblower protections to people at private companies, not just public ones. So I'm, I filed with the SEC, um, uh, which covers public comp comp misstatements and omissions by public companies. If I had worked at TikTok, I wouldn't have been protected. Um, and so there is discussions around extending reforms there. Um, and on, on making them more robust. So I, I hope I hope people in Congress do that. Great point, Mitali. Um, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that whistleblowers, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, have given me hope that the conscience of humanity um, can withstand <laughs> the the excesses of, of the business model that drives Silicon Valley. Um, and I think that it's incumbent upon us 
to really do what we can to rally around uh, whistleblowers, to lift them up, to kind of create the climate of safety and to push for enhanced whistleblower regulations. I mean, in California um, recently, if Yoma Zoma, one of the tech whistleblowers that came before, um, very successfully adopted, uh, got the, sorry, the California legislature to adopt um, the Silenced No More Act. And I think we need to see to more- get rid of NDAs specifically. To get rid of NDAs specifically. Um, and that type of, uh, I think, movement is one that I hope will gain momentum, you know, at state level and ultimately, at, hopefully at federal level um, and, and in other countries. So I, I think that there's a real um, sense of obligation that I feel as an activist standing in allyship with whistleblowers to, to do more uh, to really enhance the kind of uh, regulatory frameworks that we have. Tristan? Yeah, just to give another plug for Ithiel Mazoma's um... Uh, I don't know if my camera keeps doing that. Um, why, if, uh, another plug to Ifeoma Zoma's, uh, I think it's called the Tech Worker Handbook. Is that right, Mitali? Um, yes, it, she just another, finished it. Yeah, she just released it and it's a guide for whistleblowers who you know, wanna come out. I think I would just say this, that when it comes to governance, I mean, essentially there's these different dimensions of what we need. Obviously we need more whistleblowers who are providing transparency about harms that we the public otherwise don't know and that the government doesn't know. We need um, uh, good government oversight, we need academics, we need NGOs, but the combined power of those groups' ability to coordinate has to exceed the ability of the tech companies to coordinate. Um, that's the only thing that's gonna work, right? And so what I wanna just point out is um, if the, in military theory, John Boyd, uh, who's sort of the best, one of the best uh, Air Force pilots said that, um, you know, the OODA loop is the observe, orient, decide, and act loop. How fast can you observe the situation, orient yourself, make a decision, act, and then go back into the loop? And that was sort of the thing that outcompeted all the other military strategies. And if you think about the combined power of whistleblowers, government, academics, NGOs, nonprofits, um, we're all trying to observe the situation, <laughs> orient, and then decide and act. And every moment that goes by, Facebook doesn't have to answer to that. It doesn't have a left-right divide. It doesn't have uh, four-year plans, uh, it doesn't have four-year term limits. It gets to observe, orient, decide, and act much faster and with trillions of dollars of resources uh, compared to the small resources that are usually of uh, those combined groups. And so in getting to the world that we wanna live in of governance, which is hopefully teeing up maybe the next uh, panel of folks, especially when we talk about law and how fast does law move, um, we need the OODA loops of those collective processes to move as fast or faster than the harms emitted by the OODA loops of tech. Which yeah, is another way of saying, I I said, which is uh, to repeat it one more time, because I think it's a great line. Digital lives in democracy's house. Yeah. Um, to bring us back to the tortoise and the hare, and uh, the tortoise here, I would say, is definitely law <laughs> um, in, 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 this, in this thing. It does move very slowly, and I'm looking forward to the next panel. We're going to wrap at 740, but to bring us kind of back to the tortoise and the hare and the original metaphor, um, Shoshana, uh, your, your thoughts on this question. On which question, Kate? The, the idea of, of tech workers and the need for whistleblowers and whether most of the activists need to be coming from, from inside the platforms at this point, or they, we need more of them. Well, I mean, this, is, this has been a perennial issue. If you're studying surveillance capitalism, um, nobody is opening the door <laughs> to help you understand it because uh, the whole point is that the mechanisms uh, have to be hidden. Uh, they're hidden vis-a-vis -vis users as far as being engineered to bypass individual and collective awareness. Uh, and they're certainly hidden in terms of researchers and, you know, and people who want to find out about inspect and uh, and uh, opine and engage with those those systems. So um, all along, I mean, I I was you know researching and writing for seven or eight years um, to to complete this book, and all along I was dependent upon informants. I was dependent upon leaked documents. I was dependent upon the occasional whistleblower. Uh, you know. These are the things, and other than that, um, literally, you know, crawling the web for every utterance 
uh, every off the cuff remark, everything that gives you a little bit of insight into what executives are really, really thinking and doing. In the end, I felt like I could, um, I could, I could write a Facebook dictionary where, you know, so that because all of Facebook's language is gaslighting. And so I could construct a dictionary where you could look up what Facebook is saying and, and figure out what it really means. Um, and, you know, one of the prominent ones that we've been talking about today is engagement. And of course, engagement is one of many euphemisms. Engagement is simply a vehicle for increased extraction and extraction is necessary for better prediction. So, in, you know, engagement is the public facing term that um, sounds kind of nice <laughs> as Tristan was alluding to engagement, you know, the natural fallacy. But um, in fact, engagement is simply, um, you know, this Trojan horse for massive scale extraction. And there are many, um, many euphemisms like that, uh, you know, just things like, um, you know, cyberspace is one of my favorites. Cyberspace is a, is a term that was created essentially to defend the, the tech companies' territories from law. And they created a mythology that said somehow cyberspace is this other kind of world that is impervious to uh, territorial laws. And, uh, and, and somehow, you know, we were innocent enough and, and ignorant enough and, um, and uh, hopeful enough that, that we believed them at a time when we thought that these folks were leading us toward a positive future, which turned out not to be true. So um, all of that is kind of encapsulated in the fact that um, these companies work hard at being inscrutable and indecipherable. And if it weren't for these breakthroughs, uh, as Francis has provided us with, uh, we would know a lot less. And that in itself is intolerable because they have, as um, we've been discussing and very critical for my work now, literally unaccountable power over the information systems and information infrastructures that are mission critical for society, for individual social participation, for economic participation. And uh, we stand on the sidelines as bystanders saying, you know, please, Mr. Zuckerberg, please, uh, can't you do this uh, differently? Can't you do this better? Uh, when, you know, they have all the power and all the control. This has to change. Uh, coming back to our democratic theme, uh, democratic governance is what rules here, what must rule. This is what democracies do. We've done it all through our histories and we have reined in and constrained rogue industries uh, and tethered them to democratic aspirations and the democratic form of government imperfectly, but tethered so that we could find some kind of equilibrium, for example, between ultimately industrial capitalism and, uh, and democracy. We are in the first phases of our information civilization where we have not yet tackled this big work, the rights, the laws, and the public institutions that we need uh, to make our individuals, our collective behavior uh, safe for democracy in this century. Thank you, very well put. And this was a wonderful panel, an incredible opportunity to speak with all of you. I really do think that we covered a lot of topics today and in a pretty sophisticated and useful way. And kind of, I thought the questions were excellent from the audience. Francis, thank you so much for being here today. I know you've had a very long week. So I, I really appreciate you, you taking the time, but I appreciate everyone's time. I know all of you are really busy working on these issues. Uh, so thank you, Shoshana. Thank you, Tristan, and thank you, Mitali. This has been um, really wonderful. Um, we are going to take a five minute break and come back with the second panel. Um, so just, uh, we're not turning off the streaming. We're just gonna put up a, a holding page and we will be back at 7.45. Thank you guys so much. Bravo, Francis. Thank you. Thank you. You were amazing. Great, Francis.